So my research group has been interested in really developmental therapeutics for cancer for some time now. I'm an organic chemist that is interested in medicinal chemistry and, and really from kind of the uh, beginnings of, uh, of design, discovery, and ultimately <laughs> we hope uh, a therapeutic application. So clearly uh, this is the work of uh, some very talented graduate students, in particular Ben Barthel but also uh, Dan Rudnicki and, and a postdoc, uh, David Burkhardt. It's in the uh, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, as Dave told you, and uh, we have a collaborator at the Health Sciences Center, who's a professor in, in the School of Medicine, who helps us with the animal experiments, uh, Dan Chan. And of course, the support for much of this came from this bioscience uh, grant, for which we are quite pleased. So most of you have, in fact, either a friend, family member, or even yourself been touched by cancer. It's a, it's a major uh, medical problem uh, in this country and worldwide. Uh, so traditional cancer therapies over the years have used really what are called, uh, my point right here, cytotoxic drugs, and some of these you may have heard of, doxorubicin, also called adriamycin, taxol, cisplatin. Uh, recent research has led to uh, less toxic uh, materials that are really what are called signaling inhibitors. They interfere with sort of protein communication within cancer cells. And, and really one of the, the very first ones, this thing called Gleevec, was uh, touted as a sort of a wonder drug. It's, uh, it's used mostly for a type of leukemia. A more recent drug, Tarceva, again, it's a small molecule uh, signaling inhibitor and in fact, there's a connection here in Boulder, OSI Pharmaceuticals, that's involved in the development and marketing of Tarceva, and used for, for uh, non-small cell lung cancer, amongst other uh, cancers. Now, these, uh, these kind of wonder molecules usually aren't effective alone at this stage, and are used really in combination therapy. So we use a combination of a, of a cytotoxin and one of the signaling inhibitors, Tarceva in particular, uh, for the kind of some of the more modern treatments of cancer. Now the doxorubicin is in red because that's really our focus. Uh, it's a secondary metabolite of a soil bacteria, Streptomyces bacteria. It was discovered in Italy about 40 years ago. Um, it was evolved by nature to kill, uh, we believe. Nobody really knows this, but but most likely other kinds of organisms, but it was not evolved to cure human cancer. And so that leaves room for us to try to improve upon nature. It's not so easy. Nature spent a long time uh, developing these very kind of precise molecules. But uh, a lot of people really uh, believe this idea that, that we can improve upon this. Uh, and a lot of money has been spent trying to do it. Uh, this is the sort of organic structure of doxorubicin or adriamycin. Uh, it's a what we call a, uh, it's a glyco, there's a sugar, kind of a modified sugar, hooked to a sort of what we call a tetracyclic uh, structure. And, and what are the goals, our goals? Well, what kills people in, in cancer usually is metastatic resistant cancer. It's not the early stages, it's the later stages. And cancer cells become resistant to chemotherapy. Um, and of course, metastasis is hard to treat because it's all over the body. Uh, then the other problem is the side effects. Oftentimes, the side effects of the treatment uh, really limit the therapy. So, what are resistance mechanisms? Well, they uh, one of the like, the most common and best documented is the cancer cells uh, produce a protein in the cell membrane that pumps the drug out. So the drug diffuses in, cancer cell pumps it out and so it, it really is not affected by the drug. There are other things that are important, uh, interference with these protein, protein interactions, or what we call death cell signals. Uh, then there could be mutations in, in enzymes, and, and an enzyme that's very important for the function of this uh, cytotoxin doxorubicin is called topoisomerase II. It really is involved in processing of DNA, and, uh, and doxorubicin interferes with that processing. So the, the treatment limiting side effect of doxorubicin is cardiotoxicity. So it causes irreversible damage to the heart. Uh, 
And in fact, doxorubicin is more toxic to heart cells than it is to most cancer cells. So this is a serious problem. And the cardiotoxicity is cumulative, irreversible, and it can, can appear years later. This is particularly important in the treatment of leukemia. So childhood leukemia, for instance. Um, the, the cardiotoxicity or the cardiotoxic effect doesn't, doesn't appear until years later. What's happened is it's done damage to the heart. The heart doesn't uh, repair that damage. And then as the, as the uh, person ages, then the combination of aging and that early damage uh, lead to the cardiotoxicity. So, oh, my figure didn't come out. That's one of the things that happens to a Mac, I guess. This was created on a Mac computer and didn't show on a Windows. I should, I should have checked that. There's a, there's a, well, there's, okay, we'll use that one. But let's go through what we're, the chemistry here, just a little bit of chemistry. So I'm an organic chemist. We deal in structures and and reactions of molecules. So the key, one of the key players in what we do is actually formaldehyde. Now you think about formaldehyde is used to kind of preserve uh, things, but, but we're using very small amounts of formaldehyde in a very special way. And in fact, doxorubicin reacts with formaldehyde right here at the amino sugar and creates this little five-membered ring. And the green is that carbon there is the carbon of formaldehyde. And, and that makes a molecule which we call doxazolidine. It differs from the clinical drug by only this single carbon, but it makes a huge difference in how the drug behaves. And this is a little, these are the, the letter codes of DNA, and this is a piece of duplex DNA. And the drug reacts with DNA to cross-link the DNA. And in so doing, it triggers the cancer cell to die. And there's a picture right here of the crystal structure that shows how that bonding occurs. Now, it turns out that the next picture actually came through okay. This is more of a schematic view of how that cross-linking occurs. So this is sort of the GC, kind of this orange thing is a strand of DNA, and then there's the complementary strand over here, and here's the drug, and, and there's that carbon formaldehyde, and it's actually linking the amino group, or the nitrogen of this drug, to a, a, a nitrogen of a, one of the G bases, the G base of the DNA. And that covalent linkage attaches the drug to one strand of the DNA, of course there's the other strand, and there are groups here that we say hydrogen bond that interact with the other strand, but not in a covalent way. And that glues the two strands together. Now we don't know exactly how that triggers the cancer cell to die, but it does, and it does it very effectively. And the clinical drug, it's not totally clear how much the clinical drug is able to do this on its own. What we do is we synthesize the molecule with the formaldehyde already in it. Now, so we call this thing doxazolidine. It's a contraction of doxorubicin oxazolidine. Oxazolidine is the little ring that we created in this chemistry. And so what are the advantages? Well, it makes it a lot more toxic. It's 10 to 1,000 fold more toxic to tumor cells than doxorubicin. And it uses this different mechanism. It cross-links the DNA, whereas doxorubicin really interferes with the processing of DNA. It's less toxic to heart cells than it is to cancer cells. So doxorubicin is the opposite. So we're hoping to have uh, less of a cardiotoxic effect. It's toxic to many resistant cancer cells. And that's the, the reason for that is because it's not a very good substrate for this pump, this thing that pumps the doxorubicin out of the cancer cell. And it has a short, it's a short lifetime. You might say, well, gee, a short lifetime wouldn't be good. But we believe it's important to have a short lifetime because it clears. And it's a pretty toxic material, uh, as we'll see on the, the next side. There's sort of the challenges in the solution. So it's unstable in the bloodstream. That's bad. With respect to to going back to the clinical drug. And it's toxic to normal cells. That's bad. In other words, if you give small amounts of this to a mouse, you'll kill the mouse fairly quickly. How do we solve that? Okay, we enhance the chemical structure. We really transform it into an inactive, what we call prodrug, something that is inert until it is activated. And then what we design is, whoops, it's uh, activated really by an enzyme that's present at the metastatic tumor and not very abundant other places uh, in the body. And so although it's very toxic, if we can release it at just the right place, 
then we're apt to have a, a good therapeutic result. So what is the enzyme? Well, we're playing around with a bunch of enzymes, but the one I'm going to talk about today is this enzyme called plasmin. So we call active plasmin comes from the, the cleavage of plasminogen. So plasminogen is an abundant blood protein that doesn't do anything to our drug. Um, but at the site of the tumor, uh, plasminogen is cleaved to plasmin. Okay? And what's plasmin's role? Well, plasmin is, its normal role is in wound healing. But for cancer, it's really necessary for the development of the metastatic tumor. Okay? So uh, it's involved in tumor cell invasion. So this is the metastatic tumor cell that's circulating the bloodstream. If it can't invade new tissue, it won't survive. So it has to invade new tissue. It's involved in tumor growth and this thing called angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the development of a new blood supply. Again, the metastatic tumor can't grow unless it can develop a blood supply. And so um, plasmin is involved in that. Uh, as I said, it's created from the hydrolysis of plasminogen uh, at the tumor cell, and really it's involved in this development of the blood supply. And then what's important to us is that plasmin that escapes where the tumor is, uh, is, really, is then inhibited, inhibited by what we call circulating antiplasmins. So if it escapes the site of the tumor, it doesn't activate the drug, our prodrug, at some other site in the body. And that's uh, important as well. So again, some more chemistry. Here's the design of this thing, so we have a little name for it. It's AFK PABC doxaz. And this just refers to the AFK is this red part, the PABC is this black part, the doxazolidine is the blue part, you can see those colors. So what is this? It's a little peptide, a little uh, uh, three amino acids hooked together in a very special way that is recognized by the plasmin. And the plasmin will cleave it right here. And then we have what's called a tether, and then we have the drug. And the drug as it stands now is inactive. Okay, the plasmin is formed by plasminogen being cleaved by a protein system on the surface of the cancer cell. And then the plasmin, as I said, cleaves this bond here and then we have what we call some spontaneous chemistry. It doesn't require any enzymes or proteins. There's a, this, this thing is designed to do a special kind of what we call elimination reaction. And then it loses carbon dioxide and releases the doxazolidine then at the site of the tumor. We can buy plasmin and we can show that the enzyme in fact activates the drug just in the way it was designed to be activated. And this is a, enzyme kinetics, um, but just shows that it works in the way it was designed to work. And then if we uh, were looking at a lot of different kinds of cancer cells, in particular for this grant, we're, we're focused on non-small cell lung, but we're also focused on non-small cell lung with some other designs as well. Uh, this is a pancreas, uh, pancreatic cancer. This is a prostate, non-small cell lung. And what we measure is this thing called the log IC50. That's the concentration of the drug that inhibits half the growth of the cancer cell. And we take the log of that, so we measure the concentration in moles per liter, take the log to the base 10. We get a negative number because it's very low concentration. It's nanomolar concentration that does this. And so the more negative this number, the more active the drug. So this is the clinical drug, and This is the same doxazolidine we say is very toxic. And this is our prodrug to doxazolidine. Well, prodrugs are almost always less active than the, the actual species. So uh, we're still getting quite a good response to these cancer cells from our prodrug, in particular the non-small cell lung, minus 7.1. To compare it, there's the clinical drug, minus 6.7. So we're, we're more active than clinical drug, not as good as the naked doxazolidine. That's not surprising. But this is remarkably good for a probe drug. And then these are rat cardiomyocytes. It's a, it's a modestly good model for cardiotoxicity. Um, it's what most people use. And as we can see, doxorubicin is more toxic than to these cardiomyocytes, these are normal cells, than it is to any cancer cell line. And doxazolidine is less toxic by a log than uh, 
approximately than um, it is to the cardiomyocytes. Here we're getting a, a similar kind of activity. We're not particularly clear on, on, on this particular experiment because these are sort of embryonic um, cardiomyocytes and they may be producing some plasma which may be having an effect on that number. We're still looking at that. So, um, and this is sort of the summary slide to kind of gives you the, uh, 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 my graduate students, artistic idea of how this should work and how this is going to work. So this is a blood vessel and this is the tissue the blood vessel is circulating in. And this is a circulating metastatic tumor cell. So this is broken off from the parent tumor. It's now circulating the bloodstream. It has to invade new tissue in order to survive. Okay. This represents the, the, the tissue and the extracellular matrix proteins to which those cells bind. So it penetrates into that tissue. And now what it has to do is break down this tissue to make room for its growth. And it does this in part by expressing or producing this protein called plasmin. The little black dots are the plasma. It can then reproduce starting to build a tumor, and then it can elicit the production of the blood supply, the little red uh, blood vessels, capillaries, going to the tumor. Then this is the little symbol for our pro-drug. Okay, this is AFK. I left out the PAB-C, but this is the whole pro-drug. The active form is the red triangle, and there's the tether, and this is the recognition site for the enzyme. So the enzyme will then, uh, the drug will penetrate into the tumor, and the uh, enzyme will cleave off the active form, it will then kill not only the metastatic tumor cells, even if they're resistant, but it will also destroy the developing blood supply. And that's kind of how we're hoping that it will all work, and we're starting to build the case that it, in fact, will. And that's my story. Good. Do we have questions, or proceed on? What, uh, what, just one simple question. So you got the whole system working, you've demonstrated it in uh, animals. Um, what would be, let's say, your, the, the next step um, after that? Well, there's, there certainly is, uh, I mean, the next for, for soon step <laughs> is demonstration in a, in a mouse model, but then that's just the beginning of a sort of preclinical investigation. So the next step will be uh, pharmacology, uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, measuring you know how how it uh, behaves inside the organism, looking at at the uh, toxicity to heart and and to other organs in the body. So basically, developing a preclinical package that could then be presented. Uh, in support of a phase one to the to the FDA. Yeah.